Okay, this is for 5.5, .5, um, the mangrove forest. Make this bigger. You guys have the note page for this from class, and it's also posted in your Google Classroom. All right, let me move myself. Okay, their distribution. Um, so they're salt tolerant trees, and they grow best in coastal or estuarine conditions. So on the coast or where you're gonna have brackish water, which is a mix of fresh water and um, salt water. So fresh water from a river, salt water from an ocean. Um, they grow really well between 25 degrees north and 25 degrees south. So tropical and subtropical areas, and Florida is a subtropical area, so it grows here. Um, they do really well because there's not much competition. There's other plants that will grow there, but because of the salt conditions, it takes a lot of adaptations to be able to live there successfully. And we're going to go through those adaptations. Um, so conditions for growth, which is one of your exam requirements, um, they need to grow in saltwater areas where you're going to have deposition greater than erosion. So, um, right away, you should be thinking that wave action is not that high. Um, you won't have these growing in rocky shores. So calmer waters with really low wave action, and this will allow for deposition of sediments, like fine sediments. Um, that's what we have in our river. Um, it's very fine. There's some silt, there's definitely some sands, but it's very fine. Um, and this is needed for their propagules, which are their little reproductive structures um, to embed into the sediment and then take root. Okay, you've probably seen these in class. Um, these are the little propagules, and I've taken them a long time ago from the ocean because they can obviously go from the estuary, um, the lagoon, Indian River Lagoon, to the ocean, and then um, and then they'll get um, displaced again. And they we'll talk about how they can float in the water and how long that'll go for. Um, temperatures need to be warm year round. Lowest temperature really shouldn't go below 68 degrees Fahrenheit, but we know that it gets a little bit colder here, but it's, dominant, it's pretty warm around here all the time. And so is our water. Um, they grow really good near coral reefs because coral reefs are going to be a barrier for wave action. And so when the wave action is low, and I have a, a picture here to show that too, when the wave action is low, then you're going to have a lot more sediment deposition. Okay, the, man the mangrove species that we're going to focus on and that is from your syllabus is Rhizophora mangle. And notice how it's written, it's in italics, and the genus is capitalized. Um, so some big features that we're going to have to reflect on are the prop roots, their root structure, prop roots. Um, they grow from the sides of the trunk, they curve outwards, and then they exist above the substrate. Um, and we'll talk about why in the next slide. And they prop up the tree, and it helps them in a shifting or unstable substrate. So unstable substrates are going to be things that are very fine. And that can experience some tidal or some or some wave movement, some water movement. Um, and so it's less likely to be washed away from storms or for tides, from tides. All right, um, oxygen absorption. So how do they absorb oxygen? Um, the prop roots will help deal with a lack of oxygen in the substrate because the substrate is very fine sediment, fine sands, some coarse sands. There's also um, some mud there if you've ever put your foot in our estuary. Um, it can get kind of thick, <laughs> um, but remember permeability of fine sediments. It really traps gases in. It'll trap water from going through. It'll take a lot longer for water to go through. And so if there is a lack of oxygen in the substrate, they got to find another way to get it. And so they, oops, at the bottom, um, let's keep reading with it. The substrate gets flooded twice a day due to your tides, and twice a day would be semi-diurnal, and this will cause the underground roots to be able to extract oxygen from the water, um, be again, because the sediment's so fine. Sometimes, like, when that happens, you can smell it. Like, it might smell swampy, and, of course, they need oxygen for cellular respiration. Um, without the oxygen, the growth will stop, and the roots will rot. This will kill the tree. The structures on the roots are called lenticels. And you actually, that's one of your vocab words. Um, and this allows for gas exchange. And there's a picture right here on the left side of this. And those are the lenticels. And they actually can close up whenever they are inundated with water. So these exist on the roots above the actual water line so they can extract oxygen from the atmosphere. 
Okay, salt seclusion. So living in a salty environment, how are they able to, to live and then not to lose water because they're constantly around salt, so osmosis would force water to leave? Um, they have two methods. One, their roots have become impermeable. So that's an adaptation that a lot of plants don't have. But their roots are impermeable to salt um, and because they have a very efficient filtration method. Um, another one is salt that does enter the tree, and I believe it's like 97% of the salt does not get through the roots. Um, salt that does enter it does get pushed towards the leaves. And then when that leaf dies, it's gonna fall off and the salt's gonna go with it. And then just at the bottom, a reminder of the salts that are in your syllabus, mag sodium chloride, magnesium sulfate, and calcium carbonate. And the way they reproduce, move my face somewhere. Um, it's called viviparous, viviparous reproduction. Um, so they use viviparous reproduction and the gifts, you wanna follow the one on the top and then the one on the bottom. So the parent plant will produce flowers, those flowers will become fertilized and then they will produce seeds and those seeds will grow into these elongated green propagules, little propagules, tiny little ones. So they have prop roots, on the roots are lenticels and then they produce little seedlings called propagules. And they don't initially have the root structure on them. Um, this is just because it's been sitting in water. Here's one with not a lot, but it's just because it's been sitting in water. Sweet little things. Okay, um, the propagule will get released and then it's gonna be buoyant and it will float through the, the water and then it will, after 40 days or so, they disperse themselves. They're going to move away from the parent plant, which is good because you don't want the baby plant to be growing right by the parent plant because then they will compete for space, compete for nutrients, etc. So you want them to be able to be dispersed away from the parent plant. Um, and then once they find soft sediment, if they do, but once they do find soft sediment, they'll embed in it and then they can take root after about 15 days. And this is referred to as um, obligate dispersal, just in case that's referenced anywhere. It's not a, it's not a vocab word, but in case it's referenced, obligate dispersal. Um, they also can float around the ocean for like an entire year and still be able to take root. Okay, the ecological importance. And again, we're still talking about the red mangrove. So the prop roots create like a cage-like structure at high tide. This will collect sediment. Um, this is a habitat for a lot of organisms. And they work so well with corals. I'm just gonna go to the next slide really quick. So like during a storm surge, the picture on the top is um, coral reefs will reduce wave energy. So if there's corals there, the waves are gonna already kind of be slowed down from that. Um, and then you have mangroves in front of it. So the corals are gonna slow down wave energy so that um, it's not gonna erode away the prop roots. And then with the mangroves there, again, they have like a cage-like root structure that's gonna further slow down the water and it's also gonna trap sediments and they can start depositing and build up, build up land. Without mangroves, you might have your corals there um, and it really doesn't look biodiverse at all looks like there's some damage but uh with the corals the mangroves not there obviously you're going to have some destruction because there's really nothing to slow down that wave energy at all um in, in addition corals need sunlight and because the mangrove roots act like a cage they are able to slow down water and trap sediment so that sediment does not get dislodged within the coral polyp itself and then block sunlight energy Okay, back to ecological importance. Um, so habitat for many organisms and um, like fish, oysters, spon sea sponges, there's some sharks there, dolphins, obviously we have a lot of dolphins in our river, um, crabs, barnacles, um, we're, they're a keystone species because of that. And you got your definition down here. Um, all producers are keystone species because if you take them out of their habitat, there's gonna be a very negative effect. They're a nursery ground for many juvenile fish. Um, they will hide among the roots, which is good for them because there's gonna be oxygen um, coming from the plant doing photosynthesis that will allow them to do cellular respiration. It's also gonna be a source of organic material because they're producers. 
and they can hide among the roots from and it protects them from larger predators so we would refer to mangroves as a nursery ground for more juvenile fish and then depending on the species as the fish get older they can move out to the big leagues they can move out to the ocean okay i always love this gif just prefacing that loved it so much oh cool i can make some more great okay um just so you can see on the GIF, here's um, some waves being propagated and then the simulated mangrove forest. And notice the lack of water movement on the shore. Just a fabulous GIF. But prop roots will prevent erosion by storms. They're gonna reduce wave energy. Um, they slow the water energy, which is gonna allow for deposition of sediments. And we've covered a lot of that back in 2.2, back in February. Um, this will allow them to build up the land, like I said, because sediments are going to slow down, get trapped, and then deposit. Um, the deposition is going to prevent sediment from being carried to coral reefs, like I said, where it can clog the coral polyps and prevent sunlight penetration. Um, additionally, same thing with sea grasses. The sediment can start landing on the blades of sea grasses, and then it's going to kind of smash them, but also prevent sunlight. You don't want the turbidity in the water. Um, they're vital components in controlling atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. They can store about four times as much carbon as tropical rainforests, and they're one of the most effective carbon sinks on Earth. A carbon sink is a place that carbon will get stored. Mangrove forest is a proposed solution for reducing climate change because they can store so much carbon. And not just in their tissues, like within their um, leaf tissues and the vascular tissues, but within the the roots themselves. The roots can store even more. The economic importance, so how they can bring um, money. So island communities will harvest fish and other organisms for food. Same with us. Um, we're on a small scale, though. We don't have any kind of like industrial fisheries. Um, timber use for biomass and or timber biomass used for building homes. Um, infrastructure, it's also burned as fuel. And again, this protects the coast from erosion and storms. And we have like hundreds of millions of dollars in storm damage just from those two, uh, Hurricane Ian and Hurricane Nicole that we had in Florida. Um, so adding mangroves is just an extra protection to slow down wave energy and help with storm surge. This provides money through um, ecosystem services. So um, shoreline protection, climate control, medicine, um, like proposed medicines, and we just, discuss the biodiversity you guys actually just did biodiversity assignment and food sources um this also could encourages ecotourism and even here so when people go and see like the bioluminescence when that happens in like september october um you know our local communities make money off people going to do that and we really can only have that because of the ecosystem that's here um it brings tourists divers boating and recreational fishing Threats to mangrove forests. So since um, 19, between 1980 and 2000, um, about 35% of mangroves were destroyed. And we'll, have, we'll discuss why in here. But threats to mangrove forests, climate change. So climate change can cause change in local precipitation patterns, um, can alter ocean currents. Remember, currents is a continuous movement of water in a direction. Um, it will increase the amount and the ferocity and the strength of storms, which we've also seen all over. Um, it can lead to sea level rise and then back to where if they stay inundated and they can't get oxygen and if those lenticels are, um, are covered, then they're going to be able to extract oxygen from the atmosphere because sea level rise, um, they're going to end up drowning. Um, over harvesting is another one. So cutting them down. Human populations near those forests have grown. So, so has the harvesting of mangroves. Um, the uses for them are for charcoal, um, for wood chips, for pulp to make paper. The demand is unsustainable. And this actually was a picture that was mangrove trees being cut down for use of charcoal or to produce charcoal. Last slide. Um, from storm damage, so storms carry really powerful winds and strong waves, and this can destroy miles of forest. Stronger waves are going to erode and pull sediment away from the prop roots, um, which can obviously wash away the entire plant, and it will extract nutrients that would be essential for the entire mangrove forest. Lastly, another threat is going to be changes in land use. 
So to make more money, initially mangroves were cut down, they were unsightly and they smelled bad because they live in fine sediments that trap gases. Um, so places started to cut them down and they would cut them down for building tourism resorts and shrimp farms, and which I'm sure those smell even better. Um, but then they noticed that their shoreline was starting to erode, um, land is being lost. And then through further research, we know that mangroves are a massive solution to that. So governments are beginning to replant mangroves that they removed. Um, I know that Brevard County Zoo has mangrove restoration. Um, the Marine Resource Council locally has is that big blue building that's on US-1. Um, they also do a lot of mangrove restoration. So that's how they're improving. And stay tuned. I'll do another video for the exam questions.